Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for OA Week 2023. My name is Sarah Flickinger and I'm an Associate Research Scientist at the OAICC and I'm a member of the GOA on Secretariat. Um, before this gets going, I just want to let everybody know that this session is being recorded. OA Week is presented by four sponsoring organizations. First, GOA on the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. Second, NOAA, the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Third, the International Atomic Energy Agency Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. And last but not least, IOC UNESCO, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Goa on was established in 2012, and since then we've grown immensely, starting with just a handful of members in a number of countries. We now have over a thousand members from 114 countries with really global reach. Goa on also consists of nine regional hubs, which span across the continents and oceanographic regions. We will be hearing from most of them throughout Away Week, including right now. Um, and if you are not a member of Goa on yet, we really encourage you to join by visiting goaon.org. OA Week debuted in 2020 and returned in 2021 when events and conferences were postponed due to COVID-19. Following the successful in-person symposium on the ocean in a high CO2 world in 2022, Goaon is bringing back OA Week 2023 to maintain momentum around OA research and provide a virtual platform for the ocean acidification community to exchange their latest findings. We are thrilled to present a wide range of ocean acidification topics and speakers from around the world. So a few logistics before we get started today. Um, all participants will be in listen-only mode during the presentation. We welcome any questions in the Q&A box, which you can access at the bottom of your, your screen and the control panel. Uh, we will be monitoring these incoming questions, and our moderator, who will be introduced shortly, will pose these to the speakers um, during the question and answer session of today's presentation. For the discussion, you can also use the raise hand function, which is in the toolbox also found at the bottom of your screen, and we can call on you to answer your question directly, at which point you will be able to unmute yourself and speak directly to our speakers today. So I'd like to uh, announce you now, uh, introduce you now to your moderator for this session. Um, we have PB here from the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research Kolkata. He is a professor of biological sciences at IISER Kolkata in India, and he also chairs the South Asia Regional Hub on Ocean Acidification or SAROA. Uh, PB, thank you so much for being here and the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. In this session, early career researchers across South Asia will present their ongoing research on coastal carbonate chemistry and effects of pollutants on the health of coastal oceans. I would like to introduce the first speaker, Nirupama Saini from Aizar, Kolkata in India. Nirupama is pursuing PhD research in Aizar, Kolkata. Her research involves around quantifying ocean acidification and impacts in the coastal Bay of Bengal of the Northern Indian Ocean. She is also investigating the potential relationship between microplastic pollution and impact on carbonate chemistry in the coastal ocean. Over to you, Nirupa. Thank you, Sarah. everyone. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, so I don't think now I need to introduce myself much. So still I'm Nirupma and good afternoon everyone. So I'll be presenting on carbonate chemistry and influencing factors in the Northeast Coastal Bay of Bengal insight from a time series study. I'll start with uh, the coastal zones. I like the open ocean system. Coastal zones show a high heterogeneous nature 
perspective in terms of their cabinet chemistry. So in uh, from a Rob, uh, from Robert uh, to study of 2019, uh, it was established that uh, the coastal zone of the temperate areas are acting as a CO2 sink. However, the coastal zone, like of the nature of the global coastal zone divided in these terms if we look at a certain certain area there is a high spatial and temporal variability in terms of climate chemistry if we talk about the coastal zones now coming to the way of all zone which is a marginal sea in the indian ocean uh, this uh, bay of bengal zone is a high highly uh, unique because of one of the highest freshwater discharge zone so uh, because of the uh, this area is rimmed by eight different countries, this area holds a great economic importance and a lot of economic service, ecosystem services, which uh, in terms of economic value, it is of USD 72.29 billion. So as I uh, already mentioned that uh, this area holds a great economic importance in terms of serving a lot of economic services and a lot of coastal population uh, lives around this zone and depend upon this zone. Around 185 million persons rely for their livelihood on this zone, out of which India uh, encompasses the most part. And uh, out of which the, uh, this Bay of Bengal, the northern part of Bay of Bengal is the home for the world largest Continuous mangrove ecosystem known as the Sundarban mangrove, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a Ramsar Site. So my study site is from a, a time series. As uh, I talked about the coastal zone show a high spatial and temporal variability, which is the largest constraint in the uh, constraint in the coastal carbon budget. And we really need a high temporal and spatial understanding of the coastal zone to come up with the good climate change predictions. So this is one of the uh, Asian mangrove, uh, South Asian mangrove, Sundarban uh, Biological Observatory time series, which uh, which we have uh, long time series data that can be helpful in understanding the carbon chemistry across this region. So uh, this time series site is situated on the largest island of Indian Sundarbans, named the Sagar Island. and uh, consists of the three station and this study site is on the Ganga from Putra Meghna Delta and received the largest freshwater discharge and highest suspended particulate matter too. So moving on uh, forward, uh, so Sundarban, as I talked about, that it's on the mangrove time series site of South Asia, which can hold a great importance because of uh, its long data and we can be able to understand the carbon chemistry of this area. It was set up in 2010 and until now we are monitoring the uh, changes happening in the mangrove uh, ecosystem of this area. <clears throat> so coming up with the data, data analysis from 2014 to 2020 from this uh, S-BOTS, which is a uh, short form for the Sundarban biological, Sundarban's Biological Observatory Time Series. So the data from 2014 <coughs> to 2020 shows that there is a... a uh, no relationship between total alkalinity and salinity. Why this relationship is important? Because salinity uh, holds a very important factor in understanding the carbon chemistry in terms if we want to use the satellite data. As uh, due to the relationship between salinity and total alkalinity across the open ocean system, we are able to understand the uh, ocean uh, by using the satellite data. But here in the coastal ecosystem, as we can see from this uh, graph, that there is uh, no certain uh, no such relationship exists between total alkalinity and salinity. So this makes it very difficult to understand the carbonate chemistry of this area. Uh, and uh, this shows the importance of more uh, spatial and temporal data that we need from this area to get up, uh, to come up with the algorithm uh, for to understand better uh, carbonate chemistry for this area. So now uh, from the same uh, data set of two 2014 2020 so the pco2 which was calculated uh, using alkanity and ph so they of around 60 micro atm uh, to understand the seasonal variation so this is the one two and three which is part of s pods and along between the season so we can uh, see that, that along the station there is not much variability in PCO2. However, between the seasons, there is a difference in PCO2 value from pre-monsoon to the post-monsoon season. 
and also the monsoon. There is a significant variation between the PCO2 among the season. However, there's no significant uh, variation among the PCO2 uh, between the stations. It's turning green. I hope it's not looking green, but I think it's green. But, but uh, so to un understand the relationship between the PCO2 and the other hydrological variables, uh, so this uh, correlation matrix was formed, but I think it's not uh, getting clear on the screen. But still, uh, here, which I have marked on the uh, extreme left corner, the PCO2 show the highest uh, relationship with the pH. Uh, and along with it, it also showed the, uh, which is much, much interesting, it also showed the significant relationship with some nutrients like dissolved ammonia and dissolved silicate. So uh, this holds a great importance because if uh, the PCO2 of this region is uh, greatly impacted by the nutrient that we really need to understand the nutrient dynamics of this area to get more into the understanding of the uh, carbon chemistry. And along with that, uh, because PCO2 is more dependent on the pH value, so if we can see the vertical side of the how pH uh, is get impact, getting impacted with other variables, so we can see that pH is also very uh, near, uh, closely related with the silicate in terms of nutrient and ammonia. So maybe the nutrients are playing a significant role for this area in controlling the carbonate chemistry, which further need to be understood. So from 2040 to 2020, so this is the yearly dynamic of PCO2 variabilities. So where we can see that PCO2 in a recent year from 2018 to 20 needs to be high, uh, high. And what could be the reason behind that? We need to understand that it may be because the uh, major cyclonic events are happening in the recent years in the Bay of Bengal region. And it has been uh, found out that uh, cyclonic events are very frequent and happening uh, very uh, 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 frequently and uh, there are more uh, cyclonic events happening in this area and that might also be impacting the carbon chemistry of this region. So uh, we can understand the major finding by this graphical image that I made. So here we can see that this area is acting as a source and sink. So it's, it's, uh, it's resonating between source and sink nature and I'm talking the surface water surrounding the mangrove ecosystem. Uh, from the time series study. So it's it's a little bit complex to understand the uh, this ecosystem and the moreover, the salinity being not directly related to alkanity make it difficult to use the satellite data to understand the carbonate chemistry. Okay. And uh, it's uh, pointing toward the need of more in-situ measurements. Uh, and pH was seen among us the major driver of PCO2. Moreover, that thing that need to be more understand is that nutrients are also major uh, majorly playing role in uh, controlling the carbon chemistry. So uh, understanding the factor that nutrient is major, uh, playing a role and also some other factors are there uh, that like surface water temperature and that also too. So there are some question that arises from this, which is that uh, in terms of nutrient, if I talk about it, we talk, come to the second point that what is going to happen if the nutrient load changes? Because as we see that if PCO2 is getting control on moreover, the carbon chemistry is getting impacted by the nutrient dynamics of the ecosystem. So what's going to happen if the nutrients are going to change in the future site, which is happening in the South Asian countries where it's found that they are the highest contributor of inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus into the coastal water. So how they are going to impact the uh, carbon chemistry that's uh, up in question and how what about the increasing cyclonic events because as from the graph you can see that in the recent years there is high surge in the pco2 values so how the cyclonic events are going to impact the carbon chemistry and what about the changing surface water temperature that's also going to impact the carbon chemistry of this area so these are some of the open questions that have designed that uh, that arises from this study so i would like to thanks uh First of all, my research group members, which is Integrative Taxonomy and Microbial Ecology Research Group, and also uh, Isaac Kolkata and my all funding agencies, and also the Shiroa for and Goa on for hosting this session. And you can always reach out to us. We have a, a observatory time series. Side, and thank, thank you all for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Nirupama, I would like, I'd like to, to introduce, introduce the next speaker, Nuanji Syamani from the University of Sri Jayavardhanapura in Sri Lanka. And um, 
Nuanji has graduated from the University of Sri Jayawardenepura. Presently, she holds the position of a teaching assistant in the Department of Zoology at the same university. She is an enthusiastic researcher with a deep interest in understanding marine carbonate chemistry, climate change, and their wider impacts. Over to you, Nuanji. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. We can. Hello, I'm Noanj Shamini. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Goan and Sarva Hub uh, for the opportunity to present the first study in Sri Lanka uh, looking at the carbonate chemistry. And uh, so the... Uh, uh, the title of uh, my presentation oh, is uh, Carbonate Chemistry in uh, Nigambu Lagoon and Adjacent Coastal Waters. And let's have a quick look at the table of contents. And uh, as you all are aware that with the increase of atmospheric carbon dioxide, uh, the ocean pH has decreased and uh, this has uh, impacts on uh, organisms as well as on uh, ecosystems. Uh, the impact of ocean acidification uh, on oceanic environments uh, is crucial for Sri Lanka in severe aspects, uh, especially being an island. This may challenge us to the livelihoods uh, and uh, their economy and also the coastal ecosystem because uh, in Sri Lanka, many livelihoods depend on these oceanic uh, resources and uh, it uh, contributes uh, largely to uh, our economy. So uh, it's very important to uh, analyze ocean acidification and its conditions to link, uh, the, uh, link the impacts on uh, marine life and uh, the people who depends on these health ecosystems. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, and uh, we don't have any uh, published baseline data on uh, carbonate chemistry in Sri Lanka. Uh, the uh, so uh, to address this gap, uh, we conducted this uh, study. Uh, I think uh, the main reason for the gap is a lack of technology and financial resources in Sri Lanka. So to address this gap, uh, we uh, the Center for Marine Science and Technology uh, collaborated with. Uh, National Sun Yat-sen University in Taiwan, and they have provided the uh, necessary facilities to, especially in uh, anal anal in analysis activities. Uh, so the main objective of uh, our study is to obtain the baseline data on carbonate chemistry in Gambia Lagoon and the adjacent coastal waters, and. Uh, uh, when moving to the uh, sampling site, sampling location, uh, we have selected Nigambu Lagoon and the adjacent coast because uh, Nigambu Lagoon is, the, uh, is a, uh, one of Sri Lanka's most productive and delicate ecosystem, uh, which is an uh, estuary uh, parallel to the uh, uh, so west coast uh, of Sri Lanka and uh, it's northern and connected to the Indian Ocean. And it's also rich with uh, many ecosystems uh, such as uh, mangroves, seagrass, meadows. And furthermore, uh, Lagoon Basin is uh, uh, highly affected by uh, densely populated uh, neighborhoods and uh, hotels, tourist activities, and uh, fisheries markets. So the water quality has uh, declined over the time. Uh, uh, so as sampling locations, uh, we have selected uh, six sampling sites along the longitudinal along the longitudinal axis of the lagoon to the uh, adjacent coast, and uh, uh, this is the uh, Center for Marine Science and Technology crew uh, who has participated in this uh, sampling. Uh, when talking about the sampling, uh, actually we only uh, we did a one-time sampling in February 2023, but we had uh, data from uh, February 2019, and uh, we did collect uh, surface water samples uh, from the uh, lagoon and the coast, and uh, we have used these. Uh, instruments and methods in order to measure the salinity temperature, pH, and total phosphates and silicates. 
and uh, we have sent uh, the collected sample for DLC and TA uh, to National Sun uh, University Taiwan, uh, and they have analyzed the DLC and TA. And uh, uh, in order to calculate the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, we have used this Excel macro sheet because uh, we uh, really didn't have any uh, instrument uh, to measure the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And uh, and uh, I used uh, DIC and uh, TA uh, data in order to calculate uh, partial pressure, PCO2 and uh, the saturation states of calcium and argon. And uh, here comes to the results we uh, got uh, from this study. And, uh, and uh, this is just the uh, pattern, uh, temperature pattern we, we got uh, during the sampling period uh, in both years. And uh, as usual, salinity has increased in moving from lagoon to the coast. And uh, we got this pH variation uh, during both sampling periods. And uh, dissolved inorganic carbon has increased when moving from lagoon to the coast uh, during both years. And, uh, uh, and I think uh, that may be due to the biological pump a high biological pump in ocean, but uh, we need further investigations and uh, uh, other data in order to conclude the reason. And total alkanity also increased when moving from lagoon to the coast in both years. And uh, there was no significant difference in this uh, DIC and TA data, but uh, the DIC to TA ratio has increased over the years. And the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and we have got this variation for PCO2. And, uh, and there was a significant difference in the PCO2 during the uh, sampling years. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the observed uh, partial pressure in 2023 is much higher than in the 2019. And... Uh, that uh, and uh, we plotted uh, the DIC to TA ratio uh, against PCO2, and we have got a positive uh, linear correlation between DIC to TA ratio with PCO2. And uh, in, uh, we got also a, a linear correlation with DIC to TA ratio with pH, but in 2019, there was no linear correlation. And uh, when talking about the results we have got for the calcium uh, uh, carbonate saturation states uh, over the years, it means that when comparing the data from 2019 to 23, the saturation states has decreased over the time. And also, uh, I observed that uh, the saturation states in the lagoon is much more lower than in the ocean. And... Uh, he also uh, plotted uh, the DIC to TA ratio against the saturation states and uh, got a linear correlation ship. And uh, as per the findings, actually, when we see the, uh, these two data sets, so when, compare, uh, when uh, comparing these two data sets, we can see that uh, I, uh, the buffering capacity in both the lagoon and the coast has decreased over the time. And uh, both the lagoon waters and coastal waters has become more corrosive, uh, corrosive and the lagoon has uh, showed more buffering, uh, lowered buffering capacity and has become more corrosive. But uh, actually, uh, ocean acidification is uh, not a, a process that happens in three to four years. It's a long term process. And at least we need, uh, at least we need a minimum of 10 years of data. So we actually need to, to continue this uh, project furthermore, as well as uh, we are, when looking at this data, I saw that uh, eutrophication may have a uh, role in uh, this uh, acidification and uh, this uh, variations in this data. So we need to widen our uh, uh, study and also con to continue these studies in order to confirm or have a conclusion. 
So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. And but uh, at last, I would like to thank uh, my supervisor, Professor Kamal Ranatunga, for the guidance and support throughout the, the days. Thank you, Nuandi. Uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Navanita Das from Sajalal University of Science and Technology in Bangladesh. Navanita Das is pursuing MSc from Shah Jalal University of Science and Technology in Bangladesh. She is also a research intern at Wild Team Bangladesh. Her research interest in, is in coastal ecosystem observation to understand the complex interaction among components of the ecosystem. Over to you, Navanita. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nobunita, and today I'm going to present my current research work. And the title is Environmental Drivers of Phytoplankton uh, Ecology in the Coral Ecosystem of Bangladesh. So, the vast majority of the total biomass of primary producer on Earth is composed of the land plants compared to the main phytoplankton. And land plants account for 99.80%, uh, while the phytoplankton represent a relatively very small portion of the total biomass, which is 0.2%. So despite constituting less than 1% of the Earth's primary biomass, uh, marine phytoplankton are estimated to be responsible for almost half of the global annual net primary produ production. And not only this, phytoplankton play a significant role in the marine food web, supporting various marine organisms and also uh, uh, the global carbon cycle. So a little change in the phytoplankton abundance uh, can impact the entire food chain. Phytoplankton is very important for coral reef ecosystem also because in the coral reef ecosystem, phytoplankton represent a fundamental food source. And there is an evidence that soft corals such as the goniopora and the gorgorians uh, may also benefit from the direct consumption of the phytoplankton. Uh, in Bangladesh, most of the coastal communities depend on the fisheries for their livelihood and, the, for, and for their uh, protein consumption. And fisheries productivity is mostly dependent on the phytoplankton abundance. So despite the significant role phytoplankton play in our leaves, there has been very limited study on the phytoplankton ecology and their characterization, especially in the uh, southeast coastal zone of Bangladesh, which is the only coral bearing island in Bangladesh. So that's our study aimed to uh, investigate the spatiotemporal and vertical variability of the environmental variables and also the uh, to identify the phytoplankton species diversity and also to identify the drivers of the phytoplankton community dynamics. So this is my study area, which is located in the southeastern part of Bangladesh. It's called St. Martin's Island. And to achieve my study objective, uh, the samples were collected from 10 different sampling stations from February 2022 to December 2022 to collect data on the temperature, salinity, uh, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, nitrate, silicate, phosphate, and also the phytoplankton. This is my overall methodology where um, the study sample, uh, water sample were collected using a bucket and uh, the environmental variables were uh, collected using CTD, mini CTD, and also uh, algal torch. And we also collected uh, plankton samples using a plankton net. So water samples were, collect, uh, were collected for nutrient measurement, and uh, these were uh, measured using a auto analyzer. And phytoplankton were identified under a electronic microscope. And overall, all the data were analyzed using R programming language. This is my uh, spatial variability plot. And uh, we can see that there is no significant spatial variables, uh, spatial variability in the uh, seven major variables around the St. Martin's Island. And uh, 
this plot is uh, only for one month and if we see the nine months data uh, it will be easier to understand the spatial variation because uh, this represents a homogeneous environmental condition around the island and it's mostly because of the uh, samples, uh, because the samples were gathered from a uniform aquatic ecosystem with nearby sampling stations. So this ecosystem is open and dynamic in nature. So it demonstrates a consistent environmental state. So uh, strong seasonal variability was observed uh, in these variables, environmental variables. Here yeah, we can see that salinity uh, of the water range from 23 to 33 psu where the uh, on other on the other hand the water temperature is is very low in february and higher in uh, july but uh, salinity uh, was higher in sorry salinity was uh, measured high in february and then it started to decline and uh, the minimum value was during September and also and then again uh, it started to increase up to December. The study found that uh, the vertical data of these variables doesn't vary significantly. The, uh, the surface temperature throughout the year varied between 25 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius while the surface salinity was uh, found uh, between 25 to 32 PSU. So we found that aquatic system of the St. Martin's Island is vertically well mixed. We uh, found some uh, interesting uh, phytoplankton species and uh, we identified a total of 124 phytoplankton species and among them, uh, the major contributing species are shown in this figure, where we can see that uh, the Cosmodiscus centralis was the dominant species among all the uh, phytoplankton species. And there are also some interesting species. If we notice this uh, plot, then we can see that the last two plot, which is uh, for Planktonella sol and Ornithinocircus tani, uh, this occurred throughout the year, but the abundance of this species was very low. Generalized additive model was also used in this study to facilitate the significance of the drivers on the phytoplankton community dynamics. So this study found that seven explanatory variables ex influence the abundance of the phytoplankton species around the St. Martin's Island. And we can see that the temperature explained uh, three to five percent variability in the phytoplankton abundance, while the salinity explained five to twenty-eight percent, and turbidity explained two to thirteen percent, silicate explained seven to twenty percent, nitrate explained eight to twenty-four percent, and also phosphate explained eight to twenty percent of the variability in phytoplankton abundance. From this study, we overall found that the aquatic ecosystem constitute a stable environmental condition characterized by a spatially uniform and uh, throughout the thoroughly mixed uh, vertical structure. And uh, we also found that the Cosmodiscus species was a dominant species at the St. Martin's Island and also salinity, silicate nitrate phosphate concentration regulate the phytoplankton uh, community dynamics. And I want to add that uh, human uh, human actions such as the pollution, overfishing can have negative consequences uh, if the dynamics of the ecosystem are not uh, understood. So to make informed decision for its management and uh, preservation, uh, it's very important to know the overall health of the ecosystem. So this study presents the baseline data of the environmental condition and the fight plant and abundance to, to detect and respond uh, to the future change in the ecosystem effectively. So that's all from me. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening and thank you, Sarah Hub and Goa uh, on. Thank you very much, Navonita. Uh, I would like to introduce our final speaker, uh, Anesha Ghosh from the Center for Climate and Environmental Studies in Aija, Kolkata, India. 
Anisha D completed her PhD in 2019 with a specialization in marine microbial ecology. She is a plankton biologist who studies the influence of coastal ocean acidification on phytoplankton communities. Her current research work is based in the estuaries of the Indian Sundarbans mangrove. Over to you, Anisha. Thank you. I don't know if you see my screen all right. Yes, it looks great. Right. Um, so let me just go with the slide share mode. Let me know if it works. Yes, this is perfect. All right then. Okay. Um, good morning. Good evening to everyone who has joined in today, thank you for listening in. And today's talk uh, that I'm gonna share is titled as Perks of Living in the Coastal Oceans. And I'll tell you why I have titled this as such. Um, so Nirbal has already introduced the Sundarbans. And uh, as all of you might be already aware that this is the largest contiguous mangrove ecosystem in the world. It is shared jointly by India and Bangladesh. And it has been shrinking from about 10,000 square kilometer area to about 9,400 square kilometer area now, which is very rapid loss of an ecosystem. Um, this ecosystem, as you can see in my uh, slide here, uh, has several dynamic factors. Uh, and this is primarily the reason why this has been termed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This lies in the Ganga Brahmaputra Meghna Delta. So together, these three rivers contribute the second highest freshwater source into a uh, coastal ocean, which is the Bay of Bengal. You have a diurnal tide coming in. So that's about five to seven meters of tidal water coming in twice daily, every day. Uh, consequently, what happens is there's a lot of SPM in the water. So essentially, if you look at the water, it looks entirely brown, murky. Uh, this ecosystem is home to some of the major keystone species, uh, the Royal Bengal tiger, which is the only tiger that lives in a swamp area. It has saltwater crocodiles. It has saltwater crocodiles, which are about, um, which are several feet long, and you have the gangetic dolphins, which is again endemic to this region. Now, uh, the Indian Sundarbans, as Nirvana has already introduced to you is split into several areas. You have the core forest area where obviously nobody is allowed to enter. You have a buffering zone, which is primarily used for monitoring studies. Uh, there is a wildlife sanctuary where a lot of the conservation happens. The yellow that you see here is the original mangrove forests that are completely untouched. And in blue here, you will see the largest island of the Indian Sundarban, the Sagar Island which is where we have our study site. So what happens as we move from the east, uh, sorry, from the west of the Indian Sundarbans to the east, the freshwater supply has dwindled uh, to the east. Consequently, you find a very strong sand clearage. And as freshwater flow has altered in this area, you obviously have a very portable level of um, allothonious matter being added into the ecosystem. So uh, when we study the West Bank, what we do is we, we do a monthly sampling where we measure our ton of parameters, all of which are obviously interconnected. And uh, you can see the list that we have on top. And this has been going on for the last 13 years approximately, started in 2010. So uh, I'm going to primarily show you the page data here. And as you can see in this plot, um, I have plotted uh, this for every single month, but just for visi uh, vis uh, visibility reason, it is shortened and you can almost see a seasonal cycle. Uh, the reason why the seasonal cycle is not too pronounced in this region is because this is affected by a uh, diurnal cycle. And as you can see in the left hand side in the images, what you will see here is the top image shows you uh, when the lowest low tide is happening, there's hardly any water. You can just cross the creek by foot. And when the tide does come in, five to seven meters of water, which has come in, and obviously that causes a lot of 
um, water pollution in the ecosystem. What has been happening over the last decade is that we've been having very rapid um, hits of uh, cyclones and superstorms, which keep on increasing in grade. And in this ecosystem, what has done was that as human settlement increased, the mangrove plants were cleared off because people thought that they needed this area for aquaculture, but they saw that it was impossible to protect the coastline. So what they did is they had to replant the mangrove and that has obviously had an effect <coughs> on the uh, ecosystem overall. Uh, so as you can see, being represented by the black line, there has been a marginal decrease in pH in this ecosystem. But obviously, given it's an estuarine ecosystem, it is difficult to say anything of this accord with such uh, short time scale data. Okay, sorry. So what we did is we did a mesoposome experiment to see what could be possibly happening to the phytoplankton communities. We have obviously looked at other communities as well, but today I'm going to just show you the phytoplankton. The experiment lasted for 21 days, and this is approximately three uh, reproductive cycles of phytoplankton, if that should be a term to be used. But uh, what we did was uh, we did we um, altered the pH, and then we left the system alone to see what happens to the pH if it is not forced with pH changes using uh, any mechanisms of altering pH in mesocosms. What you will see in the left hand side graph is the orange bar basically represents an increase in pH and you will see that the pH comes down to the basal level which is the zero mark. It's not zero pH, it is pH 7.4 which is what the value was when we started the experiment. So 0.5 we increase the pH in a set of mesocosms and we decrease the pH by 0.5 in a different set of mesocosms and you will see that if the ecosystem is left unproduct by manual suppression of pH that is we did not force the pH to be maintained at 7.9 throughout the experiment the pH is altered by ecosystem components and our best guess here is that the phytoplankton which obviously take up a lot of carbonate for productivity might be causing these changes we also routinely use co 2 uh, for uh, checking PCO2 alterations and you can see the corresponding changes in PCO2 in the lower left hand side graph. What you will also see in the right hand side graph is that I've plotted. So the first box plot is essentially showing you how much pH varied and consequently the other two. In the increased pH you will see that the variation is much higher when we try to alter a pH or we try to increase the pH and then decrease it, which is what happens essentially when the low tide conditions hit estuaries. So what happened to the phytoplankton? If we ignore the first three, four days, which is essentially conditioning in an experiment, you will see that the communities have drastically changed. This is an ecosystem which is um, dominated by phytoplankton, uh, by diatoms, uh, diatom genera, uh, but when we did alter the pH, the dinoflagellates become a major player. And obviously, you can understand that the increase in diatom abundance from almost 0 to 300 is a lot of change in a community. Uh, you don't really need to focus on the kind of genera that we got, but if you just simply look at the numbers, under normal unperturbed control conditions, we had about 30 identified genera. And when we decreased the pH, that went down to 24. So our best guess is that obviously we lost a few of the uh, genera somewhere along the line. And that you can see, uh, it clearly reflects beyond the six and seven. And the communities to become more uniform. So, um, while some of them would not be very strongly affected, and which is what was obviously the case, we saw that the peanut diatoms were affected more, whereas the uh, centric diatoms were not so affected. So we plotted a winners versus losers plot. And if you can see in the increased pH conditions, uh, groups such as Coscinodiscus cyclotella obviously remain higher in number, but as the pH goes down, you can see players like Navicula and Mistria becoming uh, key diatoms. Uh, and again, uh, this is an ecosystem which is strongly dominated by 
centric diatoms. So you can imagine a lot more carbon being stored than carbon being transported up the tropical um, tropical cycle. So there'll be lesser and lesser food available for the fishes if you just talk in normal layman's language. So consequently, we the productivity would much has been increased. But when pH has been decreased, you would see that the values tend to stick closer to each other. So you would not be seeing a lot of changes in chlorophyll driven productivity. So we analysis and what it is essentially tells us that even if one the different characteristics in your children so uh, beyond days which is happening all of these start to kind of group together uh, showing that there is, a, there is a more general community that is present in the ecosystem so um, So uh, the influence in the item genera, we are not surprised by that. Obviously, different groups have different adaptabilities. Uh, we speculate that phytoplankton would be able to regulate its pH for nutrient uptake uh, in itself. So nutrient uptake rates would be better. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Anusha. Um, thank you all the speakers for the excellent talk. I think we have some questions. Uh, so we'll take the questions um, stepwise manner. Uh, let me ask, uh, the first question is for Nuandi Shamani. And the question is, is uh, from uh, Palilu Adekunbi. Uh, so Palilu has asked to Nuandi, you know, in the for the Negombo lagoon, what dissociation constant did you use for the lagoon when calculating the carbon chemistry for DIC and TA? Yeah. Over to you. Yeah, okay. yeah, we used the data from uh, Mehbrak 1973 and that were uh, updated by Dixon and Milero. Uh, and those uh, dissociation const constants K and K2 are used for the calculations. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I hope uh, okay. Falilu got the answer for, your, for, for the question that you asked. Uh, there is another question for from Maisie. Maisie, I think this is also for Shamini, yes. Uh, what was your sampling frequency for your study at your 10 sampling sites? And what were the factors that determined your sampling frequency? Uh, actually, uh, we took uh, samples from uh, six sampling sites and uh, uh, we collected uh, uh, those uh, samples uh, uh, in uh, 2019 and uh, 2030 uh, during the dry season and uh, also we collected data from 2022, 2021 and 2022 but uh, we have not uh, yet uh, utilized those data in, uh, to, uh, in this study 
and uh, we uh, took the data uh, yearly in the dry season. Okay, thank you. I hope uh, that answers the question uh, of Macy. I hope Macy got the answer. Uh, there is a question for Anvesha, uh, and that is from Sarah Flickinger from uh, IAEA. Sarah has asked uh, uh, about this very low pH that you have got under seven. Uh, what could well, she's curious to know what would be the effects on other species, for example, mollusks, crustaceans. Have you seen those things? Over to you, Anisha. Over to you, Anisha. Um, so, another response here. Uh, given that, um, I mean, uh, we, yeah, we never really, we've never seen any of these species. But I can ask around for the other people and let you know, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Anisha. I will quickly just check if there is there are any more questions. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I have two questions to ask, if that is okay, uh, to the speakers. Uh, the first question is to Navanita Das. <laughs> Navanita, what is the frequency of sampling you are doing at the moment? And are you planning to also look at the, some of the carbonate chemistry parameters in future studies? Thank you for the question, sir. Yeah, I conducted the sampling uh, only once. Uh, I con conducted monthly sampling and the frequency was only once. So, and... I'm currently not uh, uh, thinking of adding uh, uh, such thing, but uh, it's not uh, yet uh, complete right now. And we are working, uh, we are working on this for uh, further some uh, for further some other for for adding some other uh, parameters and also some uh, uh, variables what we can collect from our uh, sampling location. Okay, uh, thank you, Navanita. I think it will be really nice uh, in future if we see those data. I think there's going to be probably the first data coming out from Bangladesh also, just like as Nuandi has shown the first data for on carbonate chemistry from uh, Bangladesh, if I'm not wrong, uh, from Sri Lanka, if I'm not wrong, pardon me. Uh, my last uh, question, penultimate question from my side is to um, Nirupama Saini. Nirupama, the system that you're working on, the Sundarbans mangrove, is very strongly influenced by the land and the freshwater. Given there are increasing evidences of uh, decreasing freshwater flow, what do you think is going might happen possibly in terms of the coastal carbonate chemistry in, in that region? Oh, thank you for the question. So, in terms of the uh, decreasing freshwater uh, that I can think of, that what can happen is uh, it can uh, directly impact the salinity uh, of the area, and uh, of course the the other factors that are that are merged with the freshwater as uh, nutrients bringing by the rivers, and so these all together like the decrease in the salinity of the region and that that is what i uh, that is what i what i uh, when i read about the coastal region that is what the factor uh, which matters a lot like in some coastal region it has been seen that their alkalinity is increasing and ph is increasing and in some coastal region the ph is decreasing so uh, in particular to the bay of bengal if uh, the freshwater discharge decreases so uh, this might be interesting to know that how it's going Back, but uh, it might be like it's it's my uh, prediction. It might be like it can impact the alkalinity of the region. Of course, the salinity, and but because of the dynamicity of the system, so it's not very easy to predict what's uh, what can be happening with the carbonate chemistry. But uh, uh, but the alkalinity and salinity are the main factors that I think can be impacted. Thank you. 
thank you uh, very much, Nirbama. I think, you know, we, uh, before I hand over the baton to the organizing team, I think it would be really nice to hear from all our four ECR researchers and scientists who have, uh, you know, gave uh, or delivered excellent uh, talks today as part of the survey session. Uh, we are particularly uh, interested to hear from each one of you and as an ECR, do you have any uh, wider you know, any advice to the wider Goan community as an ECR working on the ocean acidification? Uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Anvesha to begin with. Anvesha, over to you. Any thought? On the top of my head, not really. Um, this is difficult to say, but I think with the, with the Goan EC being pretty open to communication and uh, the iconic network up and running now, um, there's a lot of opportunity to connect to your colleagues and talk. There's a lot of people who would be uh, our peers. So it might be easier to communicate than to talk to somebody who's pretty senior in the field maybe. So if you're hesitant, you can always uh, shoot a message to one of us and uh, get a conversation going. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Anisha. Quick thought from Nwandi. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, as uh, uh, youngers and uh, new researchers to this field, we are learning a lot of uh, from the go on. I cannot hear you, Nwandi. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I think uh, like, uh, as... some connection issue. I think we'll, we'll try to come back to Nandi a bit later. Uh, maybe quick perspective uh, from uh, Navanita. Navanita, you're just finishing your master's and you're working in that region. Any quick thought? Uh, yeah, uh, I can hear you. Actually, uh, we are learning so much thing from uh, from uh, our uh, uh, from our uh, surroundings and uh, like this station, uh, it was amazing that uh, it's a great opportunity for us to, uh, to connect with others and to get to know about uh, other research work and which will uh, create us the opportunity for networking also. So it's great actually. Thank you very much, Navanita. Yeah. I think I'll go back to Nuandi. I think maybe some connection problem. So Nuandi, uh, yeah. your quick thought. Yeah, thank you. Thank, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, and uh, as uh, new researchers to this field, uh, we are learning a lot of from Go On website. And uh, uh, these things provides a great opportunity us to learn and make connections with the community. And uh, I think uh, uh, it it will be uh, good if you can provide uh, the necessary training so other uh, uh, analytical uh, facilities for the people who are not uh, not having enough facilities to connect, conduct this type of researchers. Uh, yeah, uh, this uh, this uh, go on network is such a great opportunity and a, a great uh, network for uh, the ongoing researchers. Thank you. I think there's a quick point from Anvesha. Yeah, since uh, Nawandi brought up the comment about um, training, uh, a couple of things here. Uh, Go on actually, uh, I mean, we at Go on realized that resources differ from place to place, which is why Go on doesn't have a strict recommendation for uh, instrumentations and measurements and analytical methods. We are happy to for people to generate the data as and how they find fit given their local conditions. As long as your instruments are standardized, you understand what you're doing, it's great. Uh, for, um, we actually do have a lot of trainings that are available. For example, um, I think the secretariat can provide more information. They can share the links, but the uh, the peer to peer is up and running. Iconic is up and running. We have the Pogo score funding, which is there. 
uh, there's a lot of other training facilities that are available, which we do share links from time to time. Uh, if you have specific queries that you wish to uh, know about, you can send us an email, which helps us um, basically understand your needs. And uh, so, for example, nobody during your presentation, you talked about CO2 synthesis and is an acceptable, so even if you do not have a directly CO2 machining machine, uh, you can still reliably use CO2 sense for your PCO2 measurements, as long as you cross verify your nutrient and total alkalinity data. Thank you so much, Anisha. Thank you, Anisha. Thank you, Nwande. Uh, last quick uh, perspective from uh, Nirupama before I pass the pattern to the team. Yes, uh, Goan is a great platform to learn about these, specifically if you're working in the area of ocean acidification. And in terms of uh, the regional hubs that Goan has, it's a really great, great because uh, we can connect with the research groups which are working in that reason, particular that reason, and get into the sessions or meetings of the regional hubs. So the regional hubs are like uh, fun to be very knowledgeable, uh, knowledgeable knowledge of for the knowledge and for the connect building up the uh, um, building up the good research network in, in your area and getting understanding of that so regional are really helpful and the ocean acidification information exchange platform uh, it's really helpful where you can connect with the peer to peer and uh, get to know and even ask the questions so that is a great platform for the ECRs or for us to uh, to get much deeper into the ocean acidification and what's running in the community and what are the upcoming updates about the community. So this is really very helpful. Thank you, thank you so much, Nirbama. I would like to thank all the speakers uh, who have delivered excellent talk and very, very engaging discussion questions uh, for the Saro Hub session. And uh, I before I pass the baton, to Sarah Flickinger and Katharina Sku, I want to thank both of you, Sarah and Katharina, for making sure the session goes very smoothly. So thank you both very much, and I pass the baton to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phoebe. This was really a great session, um, and we would really like to thank um, all of you, all of you speakers, and, and Phoebe for such a great session. It was really wonderful to learn more about Saroa Hub and all of the wonderful research that's going on in that region. Um, be sure to follow Soroa Hub on Twitter if you're not already. Um, they're very active, so you can learn more about their activities and their research. And they also host a wonderful periodic webinar series um, that is announced on their Twitter. So um, you can follow to, to learn more about that. Um, we'd also like to thank the audience for joining us for OE Week 2023. Um, please don't forget to uh, consult our website and join us for the, the rest of the sessions. We have multiple sessions, um, more today as well as through Friday this week, um, and you can register for those now um, at, at the link in the chat. Uh, if you would like to stay up to date with the Goa On community in general, please consider signing up as a Goa On member um, at www.goaon.org. And when you sign up as a member, you can choose to join a regional hub such as Saroa, um, based on whatever re uh, region you are living in and doing your research in. And finally, um, we have a, a plug for the latest Goa On supported program, um, ORS, which is Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability. This is a UN Ocean Decade endorsed program. Um, and to discover more about ORS, please scan this QR code uh, to register your commitments for the ORS program. And additionally, I would like to invite everybody to attend our next OA Week webinar starting at 1530 UTC today, uh, which will cover all things ORS. So thanks again to um, all of our speakers and moderators for such a wonderful session. Um, and we will see you next time. Thank you.